Good evening and welcome. I'm Sandra Peart, Dean of the Jepson School of Leadership Studies, and on behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the school, it's my pleasure to welcome those of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who are joining us via live stream for this evening's program. This is the fifth out of six lectures that we're hosting this year on masculinity in a changing world. At the Jepson School of Leadership Studies, we look at leadership from many different disciplinary perspectives. Similarly, this year's forum series explores the theme of masculinity through different disciplinary and other lenses. Tonight, we welcome Charles Blow for a discussion on black masculinity. As many of you know, we, we select a Jepson student to interview and introduce our speakers. Mark Johnson is a class of 2024 leadership studies and music double major. He's a native of Willingboro, New Jersey. He enjoys all forms of music. He plays piano in two campus jazz ensembles. He produces music in multiple genres, and he organizes a UR student musician group that performs at various venues around Richmond. After graduation, Mark plans to pursue a, a career in the music industry where he hopes to use his nonprofit and internship experiences from the Jepson School. Uh, and please join me in welcoming Mark to the stage this evening. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dean Peart. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's featured speaker, Charles Blow, a renowned New York Times columnist MSNBC political analyst and best-selling author, Charles Blow grew up in a working-class black family in Gibsland, Louisiana. He earned a bachelor's degree in mass communication from Grambling State University, graduating magna cum laude. After a two-year stint as a graphics artist at the Detroit News, he joined the New York Times as a graphics editor, eventually becoming head of the paper's graphics department. In April 2008, he began writing a New York Times column, which now appears every Monday and Thursday. Mr. Blow is also an experienced broadcast journalist. For a year, he hosted Prime with Charles M. Blow, a primetime show on the Black News Channel, before joining MSNBC in 2022 as a political analyst. Mr. Blow has written two New York Times bestselling books, Fire Shut Up in My Bones, published in 2014, is an autobiography in which he reveals his bisexuality. Grammy award-winning jazz musician and composer Terrence Blanchard turned the memoir into an opera that was performed by the Metropolitan Opera in 2021. In his second book, The Devil You Know, A Black Manifesto, published in 2021, he suggests that black Americans should move to the South to build a political majority. Both books will be available for purchase in the lobby after tonight's forum. Please join me in welcoming Charles Blow to the stage. Once I get the, oh, I have a love. Got it? Thank you. So I have to, I have to get my um, baritone together because I'm not gonna let Mark upstage me with. <laughs> with this uh, way he's speaking. Um, so it's, it's, it's really interesting that they asked me to talk about masculinity and then took me to dinner right before this with professors who actually teach about masculinity just to try to intimidate me on the subjects. <laughs> so I just decided I'm going to talk about how I have experienced masculinity and black masculinity and how that has informed me and we can talk about whatever. And, and there are some things happening in the world and in the country you might want to ask me later when we have a Q&A, so I'll be very, very, very open to talking about that. But what I want to talk to you today about is how masculinity has presented itself and expressed itself to me as a black man who is also queer. I was born the last of five boys, no sisters. I didn't even have a female first cousin for most of my life. But the men in my life made a strong impression on me, in some ways good, but just as often bad. My father was a distant alcoholic 
whose cruelty was ambivalence and whose compulsion was women other than my mother. So she left him when I was five years old on Christmas Eve. Our family was the only normal, functional family that he had ever known, and he himself destroyed it. And it was that knowledge that he had destroyed it that almost destroyed him. My mother's father, whom she adored, was in many ways the swashbuckling patriarch of the family. He was a World War II hero and a warded member of the Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, in Italy, a man who had felt the burn of a hot bullet in his body and experienced and, 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 and survived it. And that experience had produced in him a sense of invincibility. My mother's only brother, Uncle Bobby, was a charming man with a little impish smile and who had followed his father's example to enter the army, but he was dishonorably discharged and imprisoned in the U.S. penitentiary in Levensworth. From what I can make out from what the family whispered, it had something to do with an attempt to sell secrets. When he emerged from prison, he was a man who mined the juke joints for women and who lived on the edge of proper society. There was my uncle Teet, my mother's uncle, who could neither read nor write, and who had never lived apart from his parents in his entire life until they died and he came to live with us. He was my only window at that time into the terror that older black men carried with them in their bones. Each month when the white insurance man came to collect his premium, my uncle's gaze fell, he started to wring his hat in his hands. There was a steady stream of yeses before the man could even finish his sentences. He had been alive when the most dangerous thing for a black man was a white man. He had been alive when lynchings were common. He had been an adult when Emmett Till was severely beaten, shot through the face, tied to the fan of a cotton gin and tossed into the Tallahatchie River. And lastly, there was my grandmother's fourth and final husband. My grandmother was not a woman who liked to be single. Um, <laughs> he was the most gentle and loving man I had ever known. He was a man who farmed hard, but loved our family tenderly. He had a way about him that settled you, that, that made you feel soothed, that allowed you to see the light even when you were in the darkness. He would die when I was very young, coughing up blood from a cancer that overtook him, and my grandmother would never sleep in the room that they had shared again. These men were my first reference points for black masculinity. They existed in a society in which their maleness carried privileges, but their blackness was plagued by oppressions. And their humanness traversed the normal ups and downs of life. It was in this world that I would first come to understand phenomena that I didn't yet have words for patriarchy, sexism, homophobia. It was there that I would come to understand the duality of the black male existence at that time, going out into a world that refused them respect, that reduced men to boys, a world in which they too often dared not to defend themselves as a way of protecting their livelihoods, their families, and their communities. And then those very same men came back into community where they were the apex of the power structure, where they regulated the doling out of respect and basked in the receiving of it. It was also there that I first understood and experienced male violence and predation, how some men considered violence a natural default of masculinity 
how it covered in them an inarticulated emptiness. It was there that I also first understood how some men use hypermasculinity as a diversionary tactic to cover homosexual impulses, <laughs> that they use violence against queer men to disguise their desire for queer men. And that violence betrayed how fragile many men think maleness is, that it is not immutable but can be seduced into surrender. That exposure to queerness was a gateway to queerness. That any expression of self that did not hew to the most masculine caricature was giving away to the feminine, which they saw as an unfathomable abdication of power. I learned young the acute pressure among young boys who are forced to conform to a perilously narrow concept of masculinity, or else. As Judith Warner once wrote in the New York Times after a young black boy had killed himself after enduring homophobic bullying, the message to the most vulnerable, the victims of today's poisonous boy culture, is being heard loud and clear. To be something other than the narrowest, stupidest sort of guy's guy is to be unworthy of being alive. And yet black boys and men lived in a don't ask, don't tell lifestyle. People understood that there was something different about some boys and men, that those had a little sugar in their tank or those had the thorn in their flesh, but no one ever spoke of it in that way, and those men never openly expressed it in that way. I was one of those boys, too quiet to be safe, too cerebral and introspective to abound in the true nature of what they saw as masculinity and manhood. Boys and men like me didn't live in a closet as much as in a community straitjacket. And as such, I leaned into the patriarchy with aims to master it, a way of attaining freedom by surrendering to the oppression. I was president of my class and captain of the basketball team, and I had girlfriends, and I got married. I did the things the world told me that I must. It wouldn't be until decades later that I would find the courage to be me in the whole, to relax, and accept and honor myself to realize that some men are not meant to fit in, rather they are meant to stand out. And this is, this is really interesting to me to come to learn that about myself because I think a lot of people spend a whole lifetime trying to figure out if they have the courage to be who they are, and some men believe that it is more honorable to be in hiding and to lie, and my perspective has become there is no way to be an honorable man if you are not an honest man, and yet we tell boys the exact opposite of that all the time, that the honor is in the deception. And that becomes the problem. I want to go back to something else, which is how black men have felt under attack, and it has been true. You know, in society and in male culture in particular, what was, we're constantly render, trying to render this thing narrow. We shave the idea of manhood down to an unrealistic definition that few could fit into with the whole of who they are, not without severe constriction and denial. The man that we mythologize is, in the back of our minds, is a cultural concoction. 
He is an unattainable idea, a perfect specimen of muscles and fearlessness and daring, square-jawed and well-rounded, potent and passionate, sensitive but not sentimental, and above all else, unwaveringly heterosexual and without even a hint of softness. The vast majority of men will never be able to be all of these things all of the time. But they shouldn't be made to feel less than a man because of it, if indeed they identify as men. And this narrowed manhood idea has been truly damaging to boys. In Boy Culture, an encyclopedia which was published in 2010, the editors pointed out boys are men in training. As such, most strive to enact and replicate hegemonic masculinity so that they achieve status among male peers and preemptively guard against accusations or perceptions that their masculinity is deficient. The editors went on to quote a 2001 study in which a boy who does not measure up to the dominant prescription of masculinity is, quote, likely to be punished by his peers in ways which seek to strip him of his mantle of masculinity. In fact, the 2005 report entitled From Teasing to Torment, School Climate in America, which was commissioned by the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, found that a third of all teens said that they are often bullied, called names, or harassed at their school because they are, or people think that they are, gay, lesbian, or bisexual. We created this culture, and we can undo it, and we have to start with this fact. The truest measure of a man, in fact, of any person, is not whom they lie down with, it is what they stand up for. If we must be judged, let it be in that way. And when we fall short, and we certainly will, because humanity is fallible, let us greet each other with compassion and encouragement rather than with ridicule and resentment. But the racial overlay onto masculinity was not absent from my queer experience. In fact, in some ways, it was amplified. Racial discrimination and racial fetishizing was openly accepted and endorsed. And it seemed to me that some people, having become a minority a min by virtue of their sexual orientation, now believed that that status gave them license and cover to say and behave in ways that they liked without consequence. As James Baldwin observed in 1984, a black gay person who is a sexual conundrum to society is already, long before the question of sexuality, menaced and marked because he is black or because she is black. The sexual question comes after the question of color. It's simply one more aspect of the danger in which all black people live, in which is very different from how he believed that white people were experiencing their masculinity in the queer space. He said, I think that white gay people feel cheated because they were born in principle into a society in which they were supposed to be safe. The anomaly of their sexuality puts them in danger unexpectedly. Their reaction seems to me in, in direct proportion to the sense of feeling cheated of the advantages which accrue to white people in a white society. Baldwin would go on to say that the gay world as such is no more prepared to accept black people than anywhere else in society. It's a very um, hermetically sealed world with very unattractive features, including racism. 40 years out, much of that is still true. And I want to spend a little bit of time on how that sense of black queer identity coincides with how black men feel already under attack and see black queer men as part of the attack on them. It is true that black men have been under attack 
from the criminal justice system. That is just a fact. Mass incarceration is a fact. The war on drugs was a fact. The war on drugs continues to be a fact. And this was sucking tremendous numbers of young marriage age black men out of black communities. Uh, Forbes found that in the years after Mike Brown was killed, they did a look, they took a look at Ferguson. What they found was that vast majorities of the black men in that society were gone. There were two women for every man. And this was not an anomaly. The New York Times followed that up and found that nationally there was something like 1.5 missing black men, most of whom had been gobbled up by the criminal justice system. Much of that was out of the war on drugs, which had become a war on marijuana, which the data shows there was very little difference in usage of marijuana between black and white people. But the arrest rates for marijuana was completely distorted. That is an attack on them. And then we saw things like uh, aggressive policing that expressed itself in places like New York and Chicago and LA in things like stop and frisk. At the height of stop and frisk, they were stopping something like 600,000 people in the city of New York. Most of them were black. Second were Hispanic, only 10% were white. 88% of these people never got a ticket, never arrested, because there was no reason to stop them in the first place. But just getting stopped, you were entered into a police database without a charge, without a ticket. They were under attack. And that made the conversation for people like me going into the barbershop or going into the male space fraught. Because I have to concede, you are right. You are under attack. But I have to also have to make the point, we are under attack. That's me too. They're not ask, stopping me to ask me who I'm dating before they stop me. And they didn't understand that they were simply adding to the oppression of other black men by assuming that we were weakening black men by being more free, more visible, and demanding some respect and demanding to be seen. And lastly, I want to say this which is, I want to talk about how being a father also helped me to understand masculinity. It changed my relationship to what it meant to be a man, particularly being the father of two boys and having to help them to understand what it means that this world would see you as a threat before they saw you as a person? And how do you negotiate that? And how do you maintain who you are? How do you have the conversation with that boy that says, you are with your friends, but you can't be like your friends? If they run, you can't. If they drink, you can't. Um, in the blink of an eye, there's an assumption being made about you that could be deadly. And there is no pace at which I can instruct you to move that will keep you safe. You walk too slow, they think you have a gun, and you walk too fast, they think you stole something. I don't know what to say in that. And to understand, as the words are leaving your mouth, that you 
are being forced by this society to clip your own children's wings. And that is a very difficult thing, but it, it helped to underscore for me what black masculinity meant in the world and how fraught that black masculinity could be. On the whole, masculinity in society is complicated. And black masculinity is even more complicated. You are simultaneously privileged and oppressed, given wide latitude and constrained to the narrowest paths. The key to living in these identities and realities is to see clearly which destructive and toxic traits have been mixed in with the benign and get rid of those. The key isn't to recognize masculinity as a higher, stronger way of being, but just a different way of being. We must deconstruct it and reconstruct it, all of it, including black masculinity. We have to strip it of its entitlements and toxicities and just allow it to be a prism through which we see and navigate the world, but not use it to strangle and to crush. There is a beauty in all ways of being defined, whichever race, gender, orientation. As such, there's also a beauty in being men, in being black men, in being black queer men. But the real beauty to, re to reveal that real beauty we have to remove the negative structures that obscure it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here and um, I'm Chris Von Ruden. I'm one of the co-organizers of our masculinity series. Uh, I'm an anthropologist in the Jepson School. And uh, I have a couple questions I'll ask you and then open it up for questions from the audience. Um, so to start, stereotypical characterizations of black masculinity have often been used to explain persistent socioeconomic gaps between black and white communities. So for example, reactions to the Moynihan Report in the 60s that blamed black men for broken homes. And, um, and then as recent, you know, as uh, Obama's urging of black men to stand up, you know, um, take more responsibility for their lives. So what is your response to those kinds of statements, uh, especially from, from prominent political figures? Um, what are they leaving out? <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, uh, uh, the idea that people have agency is real, uh, that we have uh, abilities to make decisions, uh, and that our decisions. Oh, my mic not on. Okay, sorry. Here we go. Better, right? Uh, that our uh, we can benefit from making great decisions. We and and be punished for bad ones. But you can't leave out the 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 structures that were working to dismantle black families from the very beginning. And, and, when we, and when we don't at least acknowledge those in any critique, then it's a problem because the critique is flawed. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Monahan the Six. Well, around the same time, you had men in the house raids. Literally, they would come into your house if they were giving you public assistance to see if there was a man living there. If he was, then it was a problem for you continuing to receive public assistance. So m women made the choice to not have you here because they needed help. Now we can't leave that out of how destructive that was to, fam to family structures. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm just starting to six, I'm not even going back, you know, we could do the whole slavery and all, <laughs> we, can, we can keep going all the way back, but I'm just gonna start in the kind of current era. Mm -hmm. 
we, we can't leave out the incredible, horrific effect that mass incarceration had on family structures. Horrific. And we only see a tiny, or we only acknowledge a tiny slice of it. We just look at the number of people who might have been incarcerated at one given time. Not understanding the incredible number of black men who will have some interaction with the criminal justice system at some point in their life. And that has a very long tail of effect. There was a period when uh, you couldn't even get a, a Pell Grant to go to college if you'd ever been arrested. Sometimes they would put, you know, multiple arrests it was the, was the, was the uh, barrier. But then you'd have people say, well, there's more black women in college than black men. You won't let them go to school. And, and, the reason, and you're arresting them on these marijuana offenses when all of these kids are using marijuana at the exact same rate. And nobody's flinching when 90% of those arrests are black men, or black or Hispanic men. And then people say, and people will, will quickly give you a responsibility argument. They shouldn't have been doing drugs. Everybody's doing the drugs. But, but it is that hypocrisy that is built into the way we talk about black people in America that is infuriating. You should earn your way in the, they did earn their way, they earned their way in Tulsa, you burned it down, yeah. right? They've been earning their way and making it on their own and not requiring and not asking for any help. They weren't even asking for anything from anyone and it was destroyed. But people were asking and getting at the very same time that the enslaved people were freed. As Frederick Douglass said, they were free to starvation. There was nothing that their efforts and their work gave them as a benefit upon being free. There was no, there's no extra land just waiting for you to go and put a house on it. You are freed in enemy territory with nothing. So of course they're dependent on the people who formerly enslaved them. And at the very same time, by an act of Congress, America is giving away millions of acres of land to poor white immigrants from Europe. And these same people will turn around and say, well, my family has made it on their own and farmed this land for this many years, and you have to make it and pull yourself up by your boots. That was the, one of the biggest welfare projects in American history, giving it away, but refusing to give any of it to black people. And as Martin Luther King said, they didn't stop there. They built land-grant colleges, taught you how to farm better. They didn't exist for black people. They sent out county agents to help you farm better. They gave low interest rate loans to help you mechanize the farms. They instituted subsidies so you didn't even have to farm. All the while refusing to do the same for black people. And those same people will turn around to black people and say, well, my family did it, pull yourself up. It is an outrage. It is an outrage if you know anything about American history and how much the government gave to people but refused to give to black people. It is an outrage to then be lectured to be lectured into telling black people they didn't work hard enough. Forever and ever, black women posted more engagement in the labor force than any other women. And then we turned around and turned those same women into welfare queens and said they are lazy. They've been working forever. They were just in your kitchens. They've been working forever when other women were staying home. 
And then to be lectured about those women being the problem, those women being the lazy people. It's outrageous. And, 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 and so, yeah, I'm veering off your point, but I'm sorry. No, no, no. But uh, <laughs> it is, uh, you know, it, it, because at the, at, the, at the base of it, we're just not acknowledging. We turn every conversation into a pathology pathologizing of black men. We lock up half of, half of them, and you know, if you look at, so we just take the 101.5 million black men, marriage age, right? So only about a third or a quarter of all the black people in America are marriage age black men, right? So cut it in half, just take whatever it is now, 40 million, cut it in half, that's 20 million. Take a, a quarter of that, that's 10 million marriage age. That's 15 to 34. That's what I'm calling marriage age, right? Now, 10% of those are gay. You're down to now 7 million. If you take, what, it, what is it, 1.5 million of that, you know, a fifth of those men out of the system, you've distorted everything. That is, that is wage earners, gone. That is people who can play child support the children, gone. Those people who can help to take the child to school, gone. Now the men who remain feel like they don't ever have to get married because there's so many women to every eligible man, they don't have to do anything, so they delay marriage. Women started, we, they, all, black women started line dancing and girl trips. They were like, I, there's no men left. We're going to dance when we go out and we're going to go on our girl trip. Because why not? They have the money, but, they, but the number of men in the pool is shrinking. And America is complicit in that. Every child, if they're smoking marijuana, deserves a break. Not just some. Uh, and that narrative, <laughs> no, I mean, thank you. I mean, that, that narrative persists. Uh, I don't know if it's weakened at all, right, in all the, all the years, Moynihan Report, before, after. Uh, and, 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 our, and, our, and our people buy into it, play into it. Bill Cosby mm -hmm. telling Pookie to pull up his pants and mm -hmm. Obama saying we need, I mean, I understand the pressure they are under to say to black people, you know, you guys fix it yourself. You're the black leaders. Help them to fix it. Make them make better decisions. Tell them to pull their pants up. And, and this and that, and that's going to change everything. No, it's not. But I, Martin Luther King was in a suit when they shot him. I mean, your, your discussion of these interlinkages between poverty, mass incarceration, how that takes men and wealth out of the system, what the, you know, that's... That complex narrative is, you know, like even on the left sometimes, yes. it gets under discussed. People don't talk about it. And not only that, it places a, another financial burden on the women who left, who are left. Those are the people who pay the bill. Those are the people who pay the tickets. Those are the women who go down, take the time off from work to go visit the guy who's in prison. Those are women who put money on the books so they can get a little extra something from the commissary. The little bit of wealth that is left from the people who do not get incarcerated, much of that gets funneled into the same system. Sucking this community dry and them saying, well, why don't you do better? We dare I ask a second question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will ask this one because it's you know, relevant to higher education in which we're embedded. And, um, so you've argued recently in, in an op-ed that um, we're in a period of resurgent oppression of black people in America. Uh, the evidence can be seen in our educational system, um, including in higher ed, with the dismantling of affirmative action um, and backlash against DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and administrators. Uh, so my question is, how would you respond to center-left or center-right academics like Yasha Monk, John McWhorter, Steven Pinker, um, who believe DEI initiatives and their intellectual underpinnings, particularly critical theory, uh, 
have in practice contributed to a decline in academic freedom and an increase in monolithic thinking. Can I just say I disagree? Yes, <laughs> you can. You can. It's fair. <laughs> uh, well, I don't even know where to start with this. I mean, uh, the, the underlying argument is that these attempts to bring more equity into all of our spaces, in fact, uh, corrodes and degrades those spaces, which is outrageous. And it's not mm -hmm. true, right? And, uh, and it only becomes a question when we start to include our marginalized people who were not included before. Never a question before that. We, we, we never even talked about integrity of elections until black people got it and Hispanic people got enough votes that they could change elections. When Barack Obama lost his first time that, you know, uh, well, one of the first times that most white people in America wanted one president and, and they didn't get him. And that was largely because black and brown people combined with liberal white people and they, cre and they elect their own president. And people were pissed off. And now we, they start talking about, oh, well, they, you know, we have to do this to ensure the vote. And uh, you're not legitimate if, well, they were, <laughs> they were doing all sorts of stuff 50, 75 years ago with, like, you could show up to vote. You didn't show anything. You, they just knew you were the guy down the road with the farm. Right? It really didn't become an issue until it became an issue about people of color. And that is the truth for so many aspects of American life. It's never, it was not an issue until it was black. Immigration was not really an issue until it became about a lot of people who were non-white. And that's historical. Like whenever we've had these issues with immigrants, it's really been not been because people showing up at Ellis Island. <laughs> we still celebrate that, right? Or we never talk about you know people coming from Europe in the same way we talk about people coming from South America. What kind of mother would take a child and walk them? 1,500, 2,000 miles to get the free, that's not, you know, what? So I did a little reading on like how many children survived the ships coming from Europe. They rarely survived. Those ships were filthy. Those children often died. You have never heard anybody say what kind of mothers but putting their children on those ships. It's, it's only derided when it's talking about people who are black and brown. Right? W when we created the lottery system, immigration lottery system, we, they literally thought they were going to get a, get a bunch of Swedes, and, and, you know, like, or whatever. And, and, and the guys in Africa were like, wait a minute. They were like, we, 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 and they started working that system. And they were like, let's put in them, our names in here. And they got some of the slots. And then it became a problem. We're getting all kinds of people in this lottery. It was only a problem because the, the kind of people they were. In fact, Trump actually said, what, what, he said he wanted more people from where? Somewhere he said he wanted more people from uh, in, in Europe. Uh, what was it? It was a country. He said a specific country, though. Um, but anyway, whatever it was, it wasn't a lot of us. And so, you know, that, that's, a, that's, I just want us to be honest when we talk about these issues. If you're going to change your tone about anything, whether it's what the government gives out and who it taxes, let that be historically consistent. If, you have, if that has changed for you based on who gets the handout, that's a problem. If it's about immigration and you have 
applauded some immigration and now you are really upset about other immigration and the only thing different is the country of origin and the way they look, that's a problem. And you have to be able to see that. I can't be, it's not me, dude, I'm not crazy. This is, they're history books. You just have to read. It's not, it's not a crazy thing. If you're changing your concept of who is legitimate, what is a legitimate vote, simply because there are more people who are black and brown voting and are, be, and are, are, are being determinative in who becomes, that's a problem. That is a real problem. And, and we can't make policy around this if it is, as if it's benign. It's not benign. It is targeted. And so when people start complaining about other people being included in things, it's a problem because we have built a system that for 100 plus years rewarded people for continuity. They, they rewarded, you know, we were, we were giving special, uh, and we still do, to legacies, special consideration to people. Your dad went here, then you'd be here. You know what that is? That's the same grandfather clause that they used when they were setting up Jim Crow. When they inst uh, instituted the literacy tests and the poll taxes, they said, that was the way the grandfather clause came from. If your grandfather was able to vote, then you don't have to, you don't have to, this doesn't apply to you. It was a way to get around it because nobody could read. <laughs> right? None of them could read, but that was a way for them to let the white people who couldn't read vote and prevent the black ones from doing this very same thing. All right, thank you. Um, <laughs> nah, in all seriousness. Um, um, so let's open up to the audience. Gentlemen in the front, Chris, uh, Chris and Lauren have the mics. And, uh. Good evening, Mr. Willow. Thank you for coming and um, sharing your story with us. My question is, actually I actually have two questions, but I'm gonna start with, Especially you know how long it takes me to answer one question. We'll be <laughs> Especially this day and age when we talk about um, the masculine women and the feminized men. I don't believe you provided your definition of what masculinity is. So can you offer what you believe masculinity is? So I'm going to offer, so first of all, I went to, see, I, I could cheat now, because I went to dinner with a professor who teaches masculinity. He was telling me at dinner <laughs> that there is a combination of biology and, and culture, uh, and kind of a mix of that, I, which I, I was interesting. Uh, you know, listen, there are, there, biologically, we are male and we're female. And with that comes a lot of different uh, uh, physiological differences. And we put into those physiological differences, we graft traits onto them. Some of them because men tend to be stronger than women, so they might have gotten more of the roles of building things or hunting things or whatever. So there is some biological um, reality to what it is to be a man and to be masculine in the world, but it is not confined to biology. That a lot of what we consider to be man, ma uh, a man or masculine is a concoction, it is a script that we have given to children from the time that they could, we could see that they had penises and vaginas, right? We, we dress girls in ways that constrict their movement and also tell them they can't get dirty. 
So it changes the way that they relate to toys and to play. We praise boys all the time. You're so strong, you're so smart, you're so fast. And constantly tell the girl, you're so pretty, you're so, so pretty, so pretty. So it teaches them to value different things rather than the same sorts of things. We put all the boy toys on one aisle in the store and the girl toys on the absolute other aisle to train them that this is where you belong and not there. The blocks are not on your aisle. Right? The glitter is not on your aisle. And so a lot of what we have come to see as being a man and being masculine is this construct of that we, a script that we have given these children to play. All I'm saying is about masculinity and manhood is that it is very broad hmm. and it is broad enough for a lot of people to fit into it and, and it's not necessarily fixed um, and it's not binary. And I believe that, you know, there's a lot of grayness and a not, and when, where we want absolutes in terms of men and women and masculine and feminine, I just don't think it exists that way. And so I, it, you know, I, it, I guess I'm struggling to, uh, to explain it in a simple way because I don't believe it's simple. I believe that, that, uh, I am he or him if that's how I see myself. And at the very same time, I feel no, this is adult now, 53 years old talking, I feel no desire to fit in any box that anybody creates for me, right? So I like wearing suits and these types of shoes. That's just my feeling, but however, if I decided that I wanted to wear something that would, did not fit what other people's definitions of masculinity would, I'd wear that too. I just don't believe that I have to conform in that way. Uh, and that I believe that people can, if you have an enlightened sense of what masculinity and femininity are, that you can move in and out and around it and play with it and, and, and let it wash over you as you see fit and never feel that you have to explain it. And that's just where I am. So it's, yes, convoluted. You wanted a simple answer to it. I don't have one because I believe it's complicated. Jim over there, Lauren. I wanted you to speak to uh, groups like the Deacons of Defense and Justice and maybe the Black Panthers around black mas masculinity and the protection of ourselves in, in the dangerous world that, that we live in and, uh, and what you think about that because maybe some of the people in the crowd have no idea who the deacons of, just, of defense and justice are from, from back in the day. Right, so, um, well I think, I think the idea of uh, self-defense doesn't necessarily have to be tied to masculinity. Right, I think the idea of self-sufficiency self, uh, and self-defense and self-respect, which is a lot of what the Panthers were getting at, uh, a lot of the leadership of all groups, Panthers and the Civil Rights group Movement at that time, and SNCC, there were men. So there was, a, there was a patriarchal system that was present in all of our civil rights groups because of the, the era in which they existed, I assume. But let's not divorce that, let's not forget that, that, that's all, that that was not good. There were a lot of very capable, very active women who were involved, but they just never got the shine and they were never the leaders. Um, so there, I think this idea of, of self-sufficiency and self-respect and self-defense is just a, is a universal thing, not necessarily tied to the masculinity part of it. I think that we need to also think back on all those groups and reassess how the patriarchy influenced those groups. And, and, and when we do that assessment, do our best to lift up all the women who were literally instrumental in, in all of those group successes.
this lady back here and then the gentleman here. Hi, could you talk about the role of the black church in defining black masculinity for our community? Talk about patriarchy, here we go again, okay. Uh, um, I don't know if it, I, I don't know what role it play, it, I don't know what role it should play, let me put it that way, should play in defining it. Um, but you know, again, where I'm coming from is probably different from a lot of people in the room. I don't believe it's fixed. I don't believe it's absolute. I don't think it should be something that we strangle other human beings with. One of the beauties of female society in America and around the world is they're allowed to be more fully whole. They can grieve, they can cry, they can express, they can we refuse to allow that for men, right? And so men find ways, where, they find places where they can cry and get away with it. So they cry at the football games because nobody judges it then, right? Because they need to cry. They have the same emotions, but the world won't let you express it. They won't let you cry because your woman left you. You know, you, you become Lenny Williams in that song. Oh, here he goes, oh, this wine in the, you know. So they won't let you. And I think that that is a problem. And I think the church has not helped in that regard, even though I believe you know, I'm not a religious person, but I believe that religion is both one of the worst inventions of, of mankind and one of the best. Because churches become a group therapy session. I don't know about, I've only ever been, I've never been to more than one black churches, but I've only ever like lived in black churches, right? It is, a, it is a group therapy session. You can cry in there, you can go up and tell people that you did some horrible stuff and people will clap and say, that's right, baby, get it off your chest. You know, it's it, like, it is, it is group therapy, and then you get to sing, right? And like, all the emotions are present and allowed to be present. And men can be just as emotional and vulnerable in this space as women, but only there. You know, so, it, is, it, is a, it can be a magical thing, but at the same time, the number of churches led by women, in particularly black communities, are still relatively small, even though the majority of people in those pews are women. You know, uh, it's still massively homophobic, although uh, most of the, <laughs> Most of the songs that are sang to which you gave your life over to Christ was written by a gay man. But we're not going to talk about that because we don't need to, right? So you walk down that aisle to a song written by a gay man and probably one on the piano. And, <laughs> but, we, but, but you condemn those very same men in that space because it is toxic in that way. And I, I, I have a very serious story to tell about that. that you know, there was, I had a cousin who was, as, as best I can, just by mannerism, where he acted gay, never, but back, as I was talking about, back in those days, nobody said anything, because it just wasn't said, it was small town. And he played that piano for everybody who got married in that town. And he was found killed in a motel room, tied to a bed, naked. And everybody knows that someone in that community was the person who had been being intimate with him and killed him to, to hide it. And everyone in that community showed up at that funeral to gawk, to see if someone came in who looked feminine, who might have been with him. 
This man had been 15 feet away from happiness his whole life, playing that piano. And that very same church community would treat him like garbage in his death, like a curiosity, like a freak. That is the toxicity of those spaces. Yeah. I'll dare ask this question because um, I'll ask it from the perspective of being very aware, um, painfully aware, but what gives you hope? So I'm not really in the hope business. So. <laughs> um, I did hear somebody say, if you're alive, you, you're by default hopeful. Um, so I'll take that one. Uh, but um, hope is a very interesting concept as it relates to black people, because it has been used as a tool to keep you quiet. Right, and that's from enslavement. You hope, hope you know, you're gonna be, it's gonna be good up there when you walk on the streets of gold, but right now, Pick that cotton, right? Um, and it was just a, it was a, it was a tool of mass manipulation. Uh, have you ever, ever heard about the slave Bible? Okay. So the slave Bible is, you know, a Bible they gave to black people enslaved to praise from. They took out every reference to freedom. Right? Left all the ones in where the, the ones that thought it will obey your masters, all that stuff. Let it. So it's just been a tool, and, it's, and it became a political tool. And so you saw, it keeps showing up in black political campaigning. Keep hope alive, hope and change. You know, it's, every black person runs, they run on hope. It's fascinating. I, had it, I did this because I wrote a book and I, was, I wanted to know the answer to this question. It was like, it was incredible. It was like, I couldn't believe like every one of those slogans had hope in it. Um, but hope is, you have to understand that hope is, as a theological concept, great. Keeps from falling into complete despair. So I could understand why enslaved people would, be hold, would hold on to hope of people in the civil rights movement. I would understand that. But hope is what you do when you don't have power. <laughs> hope is saying, I have no power to change this, but I hope that something out there, some minds will change, some hearts will change, some other force <laughs> will make my life better, because I can't. It is the exact opposite of what power expresses itself as. And so I personally try to stay in a space of power and planning for power, addressing power, challenging power. <laughs> and so I am uh, optimistic about my abilities to do that, but that does not, to me, translate into this religious concept of hope. We, we have one more question. I see your uh, yeah. uh, hands went up here. Charles, the first time that I saw you, you were on CNN debating my friend. But let it be a nice moment. Let it be a nice moment. Let it be a nice moment. I am as honest as you are. Okay. So the first time I saw you, it was on CNN debating my friend, Paris Denard. And it, you were so honest, not a superficial type honesty. So you grabbed my attention, okay? Now I follow you on Instagram, and you grab my attention. We just talked about, he asked a question about hope. 
and you said it, you feel empowered to make the changes. Did that power come from the men in your life or in spite of the men in your life? It wasn't, I don't think it was associated with gender at all. I think it came from, well, I am from a very, 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 very small town. Right now there, it used to be 900 people, now I think it's like 700 and something people. Right, it's a tiny town. Uh, and you know, we didn't have uh, daycare, we had great care. You stayed with some old people in the daytime, that's how you <laughs> pass the day. Uh, and so I have absorbed a lot of you know, what they were, were transmitting to me in language, uh, in absorbed a lot from nature, uh, in terms of just understanding, um, you know, I think nature teaches us a lot. You know, you, you, it's hard for something to take seed if you don't disturb the ground first. I mean, it's just it's little things. You know, the tree can tree can take a whole lot of bending before it breaks. You know, it can go through the storm and it comes back the next day and it's still beautiful. Uh, and, I, and because I was in this rural space, I'm learning these lessons from everything around me, nature and the old people. And I also left that place with the belief I was happy when I was there. If I have to go back there, I'll be happy. So I just, my maybe foolishly, maybe this is my youthful exuberance, not so young anymore, uh, but I thought, what do I have to lose? In addition to that, I saw so much unethical behavior You're arguing on this, you know, it's a, it, there's a lot of money to be made in being a black person who talks bad about black people on TV. And so I had the fortune and missed so fortune of being seated, seated next to or across from these people very, very often. And I'm like, I know you. <laughs> right? So it's, so it, it was, uh, you know, maybe it, maybe it came off a little testy at times. But it was annoying to me to know that you were exploiting yourself for profit. And you were saying things that were harmful to black people so that it would make you money. That upsets me. And so yes, sometimes I got testy <laughs> on TV, but you know, I think they knew they were putting me with these people, so I, it is what it is. Thank you very much. Round of applause.